executive responses to Becky about the draft report included a lot of the work we did was prioritizing what we thought were the most important action items and those will be pulled out and um, they're definitely <coughs> in the, the full uh, um, plan and I think that they also are present um, in their prioritized form in the executive summary. And we wel I welcome anyone joining the group. Linda's a member. Um, I think we have a new member, um, a woman, a local woman who's new to our area. Her name is Patsy Nee, and she would like to be, she expressed an interest in the initiative. She wasn't familiar with Age and Dementia Friendly um, initiative statewide, and she is um, a former nursing home worker who specialized in working with dementia patients. So she's going to join that committee, and I'm delighted to have her perspective, and um, we could definitely use some more some more people, some more ideas. They don't have to be older adults, too. Any, any Hadley resident who wants to do this um, and cares about thinking about how a community remains a pl place where people can age in place, um, which is good for people of all ages, not just older adults, are welcome. So also, you could be helpful by being an ambassador for the initiative and spreading the word and talking it up a little bit with your friends. Um, and at any rate, if you can come to next Wednesday's select board meeting, 6 o'clock, um, that would be great. I'll be here. I will be present in person because it's it just makes for a more robust connection. <laughs> and uh, closer to the time, I can give you a general estimate of when it actually will be so you don't have to watch the whole meeting. Okay, great. Sounds good. Once we set the agenda, which should be Friday. Okay, super. Um, and I did confirm with um, Carolyn Brennan that it's on the agenda. Um, and we will, I will, would like to sort of craft the agenda item to be, to just be, you know, thoughtfully constructed to, to be informative and also kind of <coughs> seek the support of the select board in, in a way that is meaningful. Um, so we'll be doing that. So will you be discussing the strategies with the board? Did this not at length. I, I it will invite them to read these, and I, I will choose, and my, our meeting tomorrow with the Age and Dementia Friendly Working Group, we might highlight, I'd say, no more than three main um, priorities to share, um, because that would inf definitely be relevant to how the select board could be of assistance and what they could be paying attention to. Mm -hmm. uh, um, but they've got all of the documents and they were given the paper copy of the executive summary um, a few weeks ago so that they had that because it's easier to read and um, yeah so I look forward to having that behind us so that we have kind of you know officially presented this large amount of work effort and the summarization of the way things are with aging in place in Hadley and we can move ahead with action items and figure out how we can be the best advocates for specific projects and change and how we can make requests of um, different you know boards and committees in the town to um, bring age friendly to the forefront or just be one of the lenses that people are thinking about when they're proposing things. Would you like me to add something about what's in the works? Sure. Okay. Um, some things are sort of, well, it's all conceptual, but some things are coalescing, and we're going to go after them. <laughs> yeah. Um, the town is looking at potentially creating a business advisory council, and the um, Amherst Chamber has all the, all the Hadley businesses that want to be are in the Amherst, cham Amherst Chamber of Commerce. You don't have one for Hadley. So... Uh, Claudia Pagmani is heading the Amherst Chamber, and she's interested in the Dementia Friendly Program. Um, we're updating our, our database to, um, to try to reach businesses and um, ask them what they might need for education and if they would commit in uh, some ways to um, maybe educating their staff or educating themselves about dementia so that they can spot it and try to um, help people. The other thing that's um, in the works is that we're going to try to recruit businesses 
um, that would be good candidates for the Boston Strong Checklist of Businesses, which is an additional thing I was just mentioning. The third thing is that <clears throat> there, there may be some Title III funds, and um, we're going to investigate that possibility to support potentially a, a companion program, which is one of the priorities. And um, we don't know if there's Title III funds available, but we're going to investigate. So that's a... Yeah, thank you. And Title III funds are administered by Highland Valley Elder Services, and I don't know if they have a call for proposals every year or every other year. For some reason, I didn't think it was yearly. But it's a program that's administered by a really wonderful employee there named Kelly McCarthy, who I used to have as a colleague and really appreciated her work. And I know that they funded other companion programs that might, might or might not look like what I'm envisioning in other um, senior centers in the state, like East Hampton, for example. What I'm envisioning and what Linda is helping me think about and work on is creating um, a group of Hadley volunteers, and they don't need to be seniors, they do need to be adults, who would be trained as dementia friends and willing to commit to spending some companionship time as friendly <laughs> visitors to um, to any se to seniors who could use some company. They don't have to be seniors with memory loss, and I don't think that anyone I spoke with would self-identify as that. However, I want that sensitivity in place in the companions, and I'm I've just been seeing a need um, among some of the people that I've seen in the last month or two for some regular visitation for some isolated people who don't have family nearby. Um, so I'd like to create a program where we can have, um, where we can both be training community members to be dementia friends and then you know deploying them as um, companions. What I don't know is if training from our staff would be adequate or if there's some external training that would be desirable. Um, I feel like I wouldn't have much of a problem talking about how to be a, you know, a gentle, patient, non-hands-on um, listener, companion, um, but there, there's probably more nuance to it than that. So that's another question for Kelly McCarthy at Highland Valley. And um, there was another piece of that. Um, <clears throat> the dementia friendly would need some, some specific training, yeah. but the companion group could also be age-friendly in that. Um, create small companion groups to support people who are, who are not suffering from dementia but who could use their solitary or don't have too many friends and they could be supported by a, a group that maybe checks in once in a while, a person, a group of maybe three or four people who agree to check in on other people in their community, sort of ad hoc. but. That was another piece of it. Right, and it could also be phone calls, although I think the in-person visiting is really what I'm envisioning as the most meaningful way to, to, to help people out who are experiencing isolation. And a good group of people now who can report back on higher needs folks who could use some company are the people who deliver our lunches. I mean, I will hear frequently from, for example, Diane Tolpa, who I think you all know, who's a wonderful volunteer here, and she delivers lunches on Wednesday and Friday, and she's a senior tax work off um, employee now too, you know, she'll say, yeah, I spend a few, I, I spend a few minutes, I say a few words to this person or that person, I know they could use the company, and she is keeping an eye on people, mm -hmm. and that's part of the, the delivered meal system too, so I think we, we can gather some insights from people and invite people to say, hey, you know, I think I have a neighbor who I, I could you give her a call and see if she might like to have a visitor, because I think I have a feeling she could use the company. Um, so this is something I'd like to explore, and um, mm -hmm. Linda, who's another senior tax work off and uh, employee um, working at the senior center, is continuing her work as a, specifically as a communications assistant, but also um, specifically for age and dementia friendly efforts, um, <clears throat> and but also communications in general. Um, so that's something that Linda's working on and taking the lead with investigating grant opportunities because maybe we could also pay people to do it. Maybe they didn't have they wouldn't have to be volunteers. So I have a question for Linda. Mm -hmm. In when we have uh, businesses agree to support this, is there some sort of 
uniform recognition that they get, a certain kind of sticker they put on their door, or something that says, yes, we've taken the training and we are age and dementia friendly. Or I think there's a pledge certificate, isn't there? I think so, and there's a, there's a checklist that you mentioned that was developed by the Boston Strong, which is the age-friendly um, department of the city of Boston. So there's an existing template that's really good, and I do believe that they have developed some kind of recognition for those businesses. Maybe it's even a sticker or a decal for the door. I'm exactly. a dementia-friendly <laughs> business, because yeah. they should get the kudos for being thoughtful, being willing to go through some extra... Um, the extra mile and bring awareness of the needs of people and caregivers. It's also about supporting caregivers. And we have to be, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. It's two-sided. It acknowledges that they've done it, but people walking in either have never thought about it and see it, or people who need it see it. True, and, and we can develop it. a brochure too that says what's a dementia-friendly business? Mm -hmm. How can, you know, what, what, have you ever thought about how a business can take measures to be particularly thoughtful and aware of people with memory loss and the people who are caring for them who could use some extra measures? And seniors in general. <laughs> yeah. I read a wonderful, there's an article, a recent article, I think it was in the New York Times about a measure taken in, um, in the Netherlands to have grocery store have a grocery store have a slow line, a specific um, cash register line f with a trained employee who is going to take his or her time, listen, and and visit with people going through. A lot of people will receive some level of social interaction that they find meaningful in the checkout line of a grocery store, and we all know that there are some <laughs> some people are amenable to that and. And there's some kind, people, and some people are not. Some cashiers, I know you've all had this experience of, you know, you're fumbling in your pocketbook, or you can't remember where your card is, or you want to check that list of, of uh, items that you bought and the prices and the discounts. And the cashiers are not always patient about that. <laughs> right. So, so that's something to look at. The, the thing I worry about, and you mentioned business, um, getting reward. I think um, one of the things we'll need to think about is pushback. That some businesses will see it as another imposition on all the stuff that they already have to do. But we're thinking about that and how to um, make it a part of something good that they do for their yeah, customers. Turn it to a positive instead of a negative. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and it's voluntary. If mm -hmm. you don't feel like it's a fit with your business, I, I have no authority to make you. In fact, so Linda, part of her work last year was to create a very um, extensive database of businesses, nonprofits, you know, um, basically entities in Hadley that aren't residents. And um, she will be looking at that and thinking about the businesses that seem to interact most with, that seem likely to have a lot of interactions with older people. And we can target a, a group to try this idea out on. And the Amherst Chamber of Commerce already expressed an interest in um, in doing this. And, and you mentioned, it. You meant, I'm sorry. It's okay. That's all I can say. <laughs> you mentioned something about um, the Friends doing something with creating a business list. Is that, am I not remembering correctly? We have one that we ask advertisers oh, from. Oh, okay. Oh, and that could be an interesting tie-in though. We yeah. can think about also specifically targeting businesses that advertise in our newsletter. Yeah, so things are kind of coalescing about being able to contact and identify people for this. Yeah. Um, so Linda, if you don't mind continuing to talk, um, do you want to up, update us on your um, Highland Valley Elder Services Board meeting um, that you most recently attended and how you're... Yeah, it was into... yesterday. Okay, wow. And it, so was the, it was the first um, board meeting that I attended that I actually had a grasp a little bit or a, mm -hmm. uh, an understanding of the organization, which is, um, it's pretty big. It's bigger than I thought it was. It's 10 towns and um, they serve, I think, 700 and some meals and have several programs. But in any case, the things that came up yesterday that might be interesting to you, the hill towns have a consortium to teach internet and smart TV use. 
Oh wow! wow. And uh, and that I thought was a really good idea. The um, the problem that the hill towns are having is funding the newsletter. Mm -hmm. And of course, we have friends who do that. <laughs> but um, they they were concerned because the, the newsletter trying to gather all the different towns and give them information is a really important thing, and they don't have the money for it. So that was interesting. Just by comparison, uh, Westfield has a program grant to offer pedicure, foot care, <coughs> outside the center, ideally to assist people who are not able to move, to, you know, travel, or um, assisted living folks. Okay, so mobile. mobile. They'll, they'll go to, they'll do home visits. Yep, and they got okay. a grant to do that, so. That's a great idea. Wow. Um, food service, I'm on the nutrition council, but it hasn't met. It will meet tomorrow. So, but the things that I learned in the meeting were that they did purchase a second van, which should some way help somehow. <laughs> they are serving um, anywhere between 700 and 900 meals. Yeah, it's, it's kind of huge. They're, they started, and this was a concern that somebody brought up at one of our last meetings, they started using Cisco and Performance Food Group instead of so many commodities. And what that means is that the food quality should improve. Yeah. Um, but they aren't unhappy with the commodities that they get because they somehow um, can use, they, they, uh, they make meals from scratch. Mm -hmm. They're not ordering meals from anywhere. They make them from scratch in their kitchen. And they're making good use of the commodities, but they are moving toward other suppliers. Um, they're changing to more food choices. So anybody who's getting the meals, hopefully you'll have more choices. And they're going to have some kind of iPad system for ordering so people can make individual choices. Um, yeah, that's... Yeah, and they're computer well, yeah. Yeah. savvy. Yeah. <laughs> if they're computer savvy, right. And then um, they are looking at nutrition factors, but I get a sense that they're really... Um, just starting to do that, looking at more diabetic choices because when I was when I was talking with them, they have only seven meals in the month of January that are potentially safe for seniors because they're um, a half of the daily allowance instead of 90% of the daily allowance of sodium. So lower sodium, diabetic friendly, there are only seven diabetic friendly desserts in the month. And um, uh, let's see, there are a lot of cake, cookie, brownie desserts. <laughs> um, and they're, they're looking at this stuff, which I was really happy to see. They do not report protein. Mm. And they, you know, carbs, mm -hmm. um, what else do they report? Carbs and sodium, sodium and calories. No fat. Um, I don't see fats on here. I do not see it. But they do have, uh, they're trying to do more local produce when it's available. But they are not keeping track of protein. And um, a lot of people who have, well, a lot of seniors actually have, have are take, taking more protein than is good for them. And so that's one of the, that's it, that's it, that's what I learned yesterday. <laughs> Well, thank you. I have something I'd like you to take back as a thought for them to process. Uh, Hadley and other towns are now coming into um, plastic reduction use. Oh, yes. And if they can, in their long run game, look at considering how they're packaging their foods. Mm -hmm. And I can give you a copy of our bylaw. Thank you. I have a question. Um, and I was going to ask it before we got to Highland Valley, um, <clears throat> but maybe it still applies. <laughs> um, Title Three, three. Uh, what is what is the source of Title Three funding? I don't is know. It, is it federal money? It's federal. It? Yeah. Is it okay? Thank it you. It is federal. Mm -hmm. But there are some there are some um, Title Three related state grants as well. And. So the Highland Valley Planning Commission and Highland Valley 
elder services. Are they somehow connected or no. totally separate? No, and um, the the, or the the agency that helped us with this report is the Pioneer Valley oh, um, Planning that's, Commission. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. So, and so, Sorry. I'm yeah. Not, that's okay. Yeah. Because yeah. I because I was on that housing production committee, and they also gave the Hadley Planning Board a grant for that. Right. Right. And then so yes, so the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission, like the Highland Valley Elder Services, I think sometimes does act as a pass-through organization for funding that comes from, you know, mm -hmm. like HUD, for example, yeah. or, um, you know, another federal source or a state source. Um, but that's a, a good point. Yeah, and right. in fact, David, I'd love, I maybe under, um, if you would, do you want to report on the how it's not on here, and I'm sorry for the omission, but I'd love well, to hear an update. No, I, I don't have a report. I meant to check on that. Okay. I, uh, the, the work was done, but it, mm -hmm. uh, the, I thought there was going to be a final finale of it, and, and if there has been, <laughs> okay. I missed it. I miss out on <clears throat> emails sometimes, and but I do try to check mm -hmm. uh, with uh, Jim Maximowski uh, on that mm -hmm. one, and I haven't. I don't think there's been any final finale, but it, it was work that was to be done by the end of last calendar years. Right? right. So maybe they they got survey responses and are now putting together the actual housing production plan. Is well, that possible? Yeah, it was it, it was pretty much prepared, but it was needed the final okay. final review. Yeah. So let's make sure we have a we'll get just get a, an update for the next meeting. Yeah. In fact I think the the uh, Pioneer Valley Planning Commission people who did an awful lot of the actual work uh, mm -hmm. said that, the, that, the, that they would not be officially working on it as after December 31st. So. Oh, okay. So presumably that plan has been completed. Yeah. And hopefully there'll be some kind of presentation yeah, some to kind the select of board. Is, uh, mm -hmm. Which, of course, has a lot to do with housing and, <laughs> yeah. and, and those issues on, on this. Yeah. Right. I, there. I really do see that effort is highly relevant to what we're doing yeah. and being an age-friendly community and having, you know, additional units of low-income housing available for older people. Yeah, the, the main focus of that, it, it really turns out, is to to satisfy that requirement that you have at least ten percent right of housing and and uh, and of course. Uh, this recent development that Jane would know about with the um, the, the Econo Lodge, the Econo Lodge uh -huh. is, a, is a big deal in, in sure terms is. of that. Uh, yeah, but I think that the focus of that committee is to protect the town from having somebody come in and say, I'm going to do this and you have no authority. Right, That's the what 40B. That percentage is. Mm -hmm. No, the 40B is different. This is, if, if a town doesn't have 10% of their housing stock affordable, then any developer can come in and plop anything right there. Right, I know. Without I, any kind yeah, of restrictions. Mm -hmm. So that's what the town is really looking for. And I don't actually hear Bill Dwyer specifically looking to make affordable housing. I think he's just making sure we have the numbers we need to protect the town. Oh, which is different than what I, many I of us. I thought it was very specifically though that a lot of it would be affordable housing. It already is here. That's the whole thing. What we're looking for is more, not how much do we have. And what he's doing is yeah. just confirming, yeah, we're all right, we have it, we're good. Yeah, yeah. So we do, but some of that is... Uh, it's changing, it's going yeah, off the rolls, it's, it's coming on the rolls. It's not mm -hmm. indefinite. Time periods, right? Okay. Um, right. So, if but those goals go together. The goal of protecting Hadley from having any kind of development imposed upon it without it having a say so about various elements and increasing um, affordable and low income. They're very different housing in the town. Those goals, to me. Um, dovetail. They might not for everybody, but for me they work together. 
Um, speaking, can I speak as a zoning board member? Yeah, <laughs> please. Um, the zoning board is, I, I guess I want to say, grappling with the increasing complexity of housing issues, development issues, and we'll be getting Chapter 40B training um, and working with the town attorneys to um, make sure that between the planning board and the zoning board that we are knowledgeable about this econolized process because it won't be the only one. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, there is ongoing efforts um, to address housing in a variety of ways, including zoning. Great, glad to hear that. Just on the aside, in case anybody heard the rumors, um, the CDC now owns Econo Lodge, mm -hmm. but they are not ready to move forward with the program we're all talking about because that requires a whole lot of state mm -hmm. regulation and permits and probably a year down the road. So they have said to the select board that they are considering letting one of the um, shelters use the Econo Lodge during the winter for housing homeless people, basically, which has none of the safeguards that their program is putting in. But it is a good use of the facility, and it will give them some income to help cover expenses in the time it's empty. And so if you hear people talking about that, that's not the final plan. It's a stopgap measure. It will help a certain issue right now but that is not the final plan for a Econo Lodge. So that's a rumor that's starting right. to go around. That, oh, they're just going to let anybody live there. They're homeless. There's no credential. Nothing, nothing. Yeah, true right now, but not long run. I just want to voice the fact that that is very much needed. I had to call around to look for shelter for someone who, who I believe was going to be imminently unhoused um, just two weeks ago, and there were no local beds at all. Um, the closest I could find for the person I was worried about was Springfield. Wow. And probably that person would not have made the choice to go there. Yeah. Um, so it was, there are no beds and shelters right now in our region. Not in Northampton, not in Amherst, not in Westfield. Yeah, and it's an issue because if, if you all find yourself homeless all of a sudden, and if you don't have transportation, and they say, here's a house for you in Springfield. How do you get back to see your friends, your doctors, your activities? Yeah, it's a total nightmare. Mm -hmm. And the fastest growing age group of people, of homeless people, are 65 and older. So well, that's the, the money runs out, the money runs out. Right. And then there's no, oh, I'll just get a job. You know, it's, it's really a dire situation, and it's the thing that is the most worrisome issue to me in the town. Yeah. Okay, uh, the next, I really, the, the next um, agenda item is very brief. Uh, I've been speaking a little bit with Mary Lou, um, gosh, I'm going to mispronounce her last name, Mary Lou Meta, Medak. She's Christian Stanley's mother. Does anybody know her? Oh, yes, Northampton. Yeah, lovely woman. Right, and she wrote a recent book on major life transitions and going through them alone, and um, she is also a professional organizer. And I have been wanting to, to, to jumpstart a new decluttering group here at the Senior Center, an in-person, at least monthly, maybe every other week, group for people who are, want to work together and use the peer support model to simply start getting rid of your belongings, organize, talk to other people going through the same thing, deal with it before it's a crisis. Um, and she is, is interested in leading it. So I just want you to know that we're, in, we're talking now and I would like to pay her and I'll do that out of our gifts and donations account. Um, I think it would be really money well spent to have a paid facilitator who's a, you know, who has credentials in organizing and coaching. Um, but it really the real work happens with the magic of people talking together about the shared experience of going through this process. Something I'm actually meaning to jumpstart with a, my own group of friends because we need to do it too. Almost everybody we needs to. We all need to do it. We all need to do it. So to me, you know, we've got 
hoarding scenarios that emerge as housing crises on one end of the spectrum, I want to meet it upstream so that we're, let's think about it earlier in our lives and not burden whoever is left holding the bag at the end when there's a complete meltdown of all systems. <laughs> or, or, as my children say, we're so glad you moved and got rid of all that junk. <laughs> right, I know. I uh, shudder at the idea of my, my son um, handling our books. About five years ago, I started a process that I read about and I thought it was a good idea. One new thing in, two things out. This is very simple. Yeah, it's great. Two things out. Mm -hmm. Hospice, Salvation Army, Goodwill, wherever, friends, two things out. Yeah, great rule of thumb. Gets more complicated when you're living with someone else. Yes. <laughs> Who might not agree with your values on that. You're not going to get rid of my bobbleheads. <laughs> I know, I read all these great ideas, I'm like, that's great, but how do I persuade other people I live with? <laughs> um, I think, well, like, we already went, the next item is the um, companion volunteer program idea that we've already talked about, so um, unless people have other things to add about that, I think we're, we don't really need to spend more time on that. Um, and as I've gotten accustomed to doing, I just thought I'd, and we did this last time because I did have that sneak preview of the January um, calendar of events to look at, but I just want to kind of go over again a couple of things that are coming up. I've already talked about the select board meeting next week that I'm hoping you can attend. Um, and there are a couple of other things that would be particularly nice for board members to, to attend. Again, of course, I understand it's completely voluntary. You're volunteers, but your presence is always welcome and it always really boosts whatever we're doing. Um, sometimes something that's kind of underutilized are these after two tea um, sort of mini programs that Violet organizes. The one that's happening next Tuesday afternoon at two is um, a focus on baby pictures. People bringing your own baby pictures and having a guessing game about who's who. You know, we had an after two tea about um, Christmas traditions in December that was really sweet. It was just her. It was Violet, me, Nancy, Nigella and Marlene Merzbach, but we had, and we brought in objects, um, you know, sort of holiday artifacts from our home to talk about their history. And it's just so simple, but a nice just little sharing, show and tell opportunity to kind of learn something about someone that you never knew before. And um, so I feel like that's usually the, the emphasis of the after 2 T experiences are sharing and um, getting to know each other better. So if you want to do that, I'd love to have you. Um, there's a can't, I, I don't, well, cooking no, mac and cheese with Nora probably doesn't need any amplification. I think people will readily jump on that. Um, but it is a fun opportunity that's coming up and she makes a mean mac and cheese. That's going to be next Wednesday, um, the 18th at 1230. And it's, I think it's $5, but you, you get to eat some mac and cheese, include your lunch. Um, there's a cannabis education seminar um, at 2 o'clock, and um, I, I forget the name of the local business that's leading it, but they're just talking about the uses and pitfalls of, of, of cannabis um, for health and recreation, and they'll be um, just giving a talk um, and demystifying it and talking about the endocannabinoid system, which is apparently the system in one's body that responds to the drug in Products. We did a similar lecture when we were over at Most Holy Redeemer, and probably if we could pull out of my senior center who attended that and let them know this is happening. Oh, that's a good idea. Really useful. So, okay. It happened in the spring. Do you remember um, the year? That would have been 20. And there was spring one last year. Yeah, there was one last year. Sure that, that, that one last that year. Yeah, there was one here, and that was with Leslie Laurie, the founder of Netta. Netta, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The other one was uh, Ezra Arsbach, who is the consultant now for basically most of the... Yeah, well, uh, we can look into ways of reaching out to people who have expressed an interest in the past. Good idea. I mean, that was a packed audience. Okay. I think we probably had 30 people. Oh, gosh. Wow. Yeah, the one that was here last year was packed too. Yeah, yeah. It's a it's a program that people want to know about. Right, and she left a book behind. That some of us are just beyond the age when everybody did that. <laughs> right, <laughs> it wasn't an option. Right, yeah, it wasn't part of your culture or lifestyle when you were the adult. Yeah, younger. 
Um, coffee with a cob again, that doesn't usually need much of a much much amplification because it tends to be popular, but that's next Thursday at two and there are always great questions, good information shared. Um, any of the officers who present do a wonderful job and engage as you know, engage in a really genuine, nice way with the community. So hope you can make it to that. And we always have some nice um, refreshments. Oh, and I want to mention that and Going back to at the end of this week, Friday night is the art show opening from 6 to 8 for Nadine Gallo, who's the artist whose work is up right now. Um, I, if you can, that is a wonderful, that it's very supportive to come to that, and it's, those are very fun. It's not, it's, you never have, don't ever think you need to stay the whole time. You can stop in, take a look at the art, grab a little snack and go, but it's just so <coughs> nice for the artist to have good attendance and appreciative people and it's often if you're someone who doesn't display work regularly it's a very memorable event and it feels really good to have people looking at your work and asking questions and Nadine happens to be a fascinating person with a ton of personality and she will will invite her to speak a little bit about the art and I'm sure and she has great things to say and um, is a really engaging person so I just encourage you if you can to come to that art show opening on Friday night it's very friendly it's not snooty not not the <laughs> least. Not your snooty art show not <laughs> the least. it's very down to earth and, yeah. and it's, it's good fun and it's nice to be here in the evening it's just got a different feeling to it yeah um, I, I want to okay so lastly I'll mention that at the end of the month the last on the 30th, so Monday the 30th at 1 o'clock, the Friends are hosting our legislators, Senator Comerford and Representative Dan Carey. That, it, it is a bit embarrassing when no one comes to that <laughs> because they're, you know, it's hard enough to get them to show up and I really want constituents to take advantage of the opportunity to ask them questions. They usually start by summarizing some of the legislation that's been, you know, that they've been involved with supporting in the last couple of months or when the session started and they are very open to questions any concerns you have that you feel are you know kind of relevant for the big picture of our region and Hadley specifically they are all ears and it's it's a again it's very down-to-earth friendly share some snacks have a cup of coffee get some updates and then voice concerns or observations and it's good to get to know them and to solidify the bond we have with them so if you can come to that, I strongly encourage that. Thank you. Um, and lastly, the last day of the month, um, the gentleman from Tanzania, who I gave a tour to the building, because they were looking to figure out how to open a senior center, have offered to come back and cook a Tanzanian meal. And thanks for the information we gave them. On the 31st? On the 31st. Yeah, at, two, at 1230. So I think it's a lunch and learn. So it's, again, there's a lunch and learn, and it's free, but they're, we're asking for donations for them to, you know, seed money for them to build their new senior center in Tanzania. So. Excellent. I hadn't realized that it had that component to it. That's great. Um, so, you know, again, we have just this wonderfully populated calendar of really good things happening. And a variety. And a really yeah. good variety. Violet, if you don't know, compared to any other senior mm. center, Violet's magnificent. Yeah. Mm. yeah, she does a fantastic job. Absolutely. Yeah, she was looking at the Belcher Town uh, newsletter, oh, yeah. and, they had, and they had like four programs, and she was saying, Look at how easy their job is. You know? <laughs> Only four programs. Yeah, even Northampton's does nothing compared oh, no. to what we do. I'm going to go to the one here this afternoon at 12:30. That's the work on your brain one. <laughs> learning and retirement. Oh, the learning and retirement. Right. The exercise your mind. Yeah. The introduction to that program. Has anyone here ever participated in the Five Colleges Inc. Learning and Retirement? Program. Have you done that, Jane? Yeah. Ever? I tried at one point, but the scheduling was right. Yeah. I um, have it personally, but I've known a lot of people who have and get very enthused about right. it. Of course, I think it's great. Brewer, our yeah. 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 yeah, he was um, <clears throat> an organizer, I think, or probably on their board too, and mm -hmm. an enthusiastic mm -hmm. um, yeah. member of that community. And it just seems excellent. Um, so I'll let you know what I learned. Okay. How my brain was improved. If you remember. <laughs> right. I'll write it down. Okay, yeah, so that's today at 1230. Thank you. I'm glad you'll be there. Um, I just, so I think 
everyone knows that, I think everyone knows someone who's recently gotten COVID. Nonetheless, the numbers are not very elevated and hardly according to official knowledge of who has COVID, right? So that's the key. But they are now doing a test on the sewage in Hadley that I get the weekly report. Oh. Mm. Now, this is not us. This is Hadley, which includes the Route 9 corridor. The stores and the restaurants go into the sewage system. And the hotels. And the hotels. Okay. So visitors, and we're at 80% of the numbers being reported currently. That was last week's report. Wow. Can you send me a link to that report? I'd sure. be interested well, to take well, a look you, at that. What do you mean by 80% So what? the number of COVID SARS markers, I don't know how you do this, but they test the water, mm -hmm. send it to Boston. Boston puts out the test of everybody in the state who's participating in the program. And Hadley was at the last week, we were 80. From the top being 100, we were 80th. So, 80th. In, in, in terms of volume, more more than less, one of the higher end uh -huh. communities. Okay. Mm. It doesn't say who the others are. It only identifies your own community. It's I mean, based on population? It per thousand or per liter or per whatever. So it's not by population, it's no. just percent in the water. Mm. 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 Wow. Mm. Well, yeah. And that doesn't say anything about numbers. It just says yeah. it's higher than a lot of places. Right, and we in and we know some that. basic ways know why. We know exactly why, but it still is an issue. And if you're going out in public, wear your mask. Mm -hmm. And if you're flying on a plane, mm -hmm. good luck. <laughs> yeah. uh, so, okay, that's, that's interesting to know that that report now exists. Um, something, I added a new line of data to this statistical report because I, uh, I didn't think that um, outreach efforts are particularly well captured. Um, so this indicates that Lauren has helped 12 people with fuel assistance applications in December alone. Um, you know, that's, that's quite a lot. Fuel assistance applications require um, a lot of documentation. So, you know, it's, it's usually one, one meeting with a client who wants to, to apply to, to get it all together. But it's, it's, a, it's quite a lot for any individual who want, or household who wants to do this to put together. Um, and it would be, you know, open enrollment for, you know, Medicare-based health insurance plans ended December 7th. And um, so I did the range, um, the range of time that I looked at was between October 15th and December 7th, which is the open enrollment period. And I think it's actually, I don't know if my number is right, but 13 in, in um, 13 people were, were served um, by Jane Sullivan, our um our excellent Shine counselor. We're still getting a lot of calls, so I'm gonna. I think I'm gonna. So Shine will be something that I'm now monthly sharing with you. How many Shine appointments are had, either by Jane or myself? And I have a couple. I'll take. I know. So for you know, if I know that Jane is is busy with several, I will take one. And it's good. I need to maintain my own knowledge of the rules around Medicare, so it's good for me to see people in order to keep sharp in that. Um, no, no SNAP applications are for um, what used to be known as food stamps. Um, no, um, I don't think we, I don't think Lauren served anyone with that need last in um, in December. But a lot, of, but I see, but eleven people were assisted by her for Mass Health. That could be submitting a new application. It could be asking questions about their existing Mass Health coverage or program that they're in. It could be helping someone decipher the mail they receive from Mass Health because when you're on Mass Health you get regular um, correspondence and it's not always it's never easy to decipher and redetermination so um, it's supposed to be yearly that's not the way it really is but in theory anyone on Mass Health will receive a redetermination form which is almost like doing the whole application over again every year to verify the income because the income and asset limits are so strict. This is your way to say, yeah, I'm still eligible or no, I'm not. I had a windfall and now I have a hundred thousand dollars. I didn't have. Um, so that those are pretty meaty items for um, outreach. And I just wanted you to be aware of those. 
looks like the building is getting used by a lot of town functions now. Yeah, let's take a look up at that because that is happening. So, I mean, we building use is on the rise um, with both you know municipal groups and non-municipal groups, and um, you know we have. So I I tried to capture all of those. You might I don't know if you, you know that the Fisher Home Hospice Bereavement Group is here. Um, weekly they have their own and that will be I think coming to a close and then they're they've developed another monthly program and I did speak in Jane I just want you to know I spoke with the organizers and it is walk-in basis and also we can take registration and I let Patsy me know that thank you um, so that is accessible to anyone um, who is processing a loss and would really like the benefit of speaking in a group and it'll be um, it'll be facilitated by um, an, an employee of the Fisher home named um, Josh Velez, um, and that's starting at the end of this month. Um, that's that's just an example of another group. Um, COSA, I think that's the Coalition of Social Service Agencies in Hampshire County. They had a large legislative meet, meet and greet and sort of um, gathering, and the legislators were invited and spoke, and that happened in December, and it was good to be able to utilize the dining room for that. Um, that was packed. It was packed, yeah. right. Yeah. It brought in a lot of people. And so, you know, it doesn't directly serve, you know, it was for them and their members and the legislators, but I feel like any large organization that is social service focused is relevant for, you know, it, it's a good use of the building to me. I um, encourage you, <laughs> as you have been doing, to watch closely what those groups are mm -hmm. on Saturday, the library had a group that got out of hand that Patrick had not realized how big it was going to get, and they had over 200 people. Oh my, oh my goodness. What was it for? What, what was it, was, it was a Northampton group who wanted to use the building, oh. and it was an anti-vax group. Oh, God. Were they oh in, the, in, the board, in, that, in the large in meeting the large space? Room, but they, the part, I came for another meeting here, um, and parking lot was full. Wow. Even when we've been full, this was full. Wow. Okay. An anti-vax group? <laughs> wow. Well, I'm judging we'll requests on a case-by-case -case exactly. basis. Exactly, and, and that I think is most appropriate, and I encourage you to continue Yeah, I just that. feel like if it seems reasonable, accommodatable, and, and a benefit to this community, and particularly relevant to the people that we serve, and it, and it can be done without Disruption. going through you know, a lot of difficulty, then I want to say yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and well, it should be. Yeah. Great building. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so that's it for me. Any unforeseen business or well, yeah, tax prep started? Yes. yes. Okay. Good point. So the AARP tax prep program is, um, we'll be hosting it again this year. Uh, we are now taking names. Um, it will begin, I think, February 17th, actually. Um, and it will run until, um, or February 15th, and it will run until like a couple of days before the tax filing deadline in April. They'll be, the, the tax prep volunteers will be here every other Wednesday. Um, we're, so we're taking names and contact information for people who want to attend. We do serve people who are out of town. They, they, the AARP doesn't, like Shine, we can't, you can't really turn someone away based on locale. So we don't say no to an Amherst person who wants to get their taxes done here. And we haven't been so overwhelmed with people that it's been a problem. Um, I just submitted a press release to the Gazette that should be showing up any day now. We also systematically, you know, get in touch with, well, I'll do a robocall to people who have, all the people who have received it in the last, say, three years, they will get a call inviting them to indicate their interest. And then, so we, first we get the general list of the names, and then later in the month, when, when Pat knows how many volunteers he has, that's when he can figure out how many packets they can process, how many ta people's ta things they can process in a day. And then we'll be able to schedule. So there's a bit of a process where you simply indicate your interest in having the service, and then there'll be another communication informing people of when. Um, and we'll use the same system that's been utilized in the last two years will be utilized this year, which is that people don't have actual physical appointments. They have their packets with all of their materials ready ready to go, and then they put them in our drop box, and then people agree to be available to, by phone all day long, and at the end, and the way, and when it works smoothly, which is most of the time, 
they will be summoned at the end of the day with a phone call. They'll come. They, there has to be a physical signature. That takes place in person in the dining room, and then they have, and then it's they are giving permission for the tax preparers to electronically file their taxes. So that's happening, and it, it's been go, it's gone smoothly the last couple of years. We're all, there's a lot of phone calls, so I guess it's hardest on reception. Um, but and um, I do a lot of organizing with, with Pat. Um, we make up the packets too. So Pat gives me some hard copies. I copy a lot of things. We put them in envelopes and make them available to people. Those will be ready by. Um, Again, uh, in, a, in another couple of weeks, I don't have the materials from Pat yet. So it's just going as usual. We're, you know, we get a little bit better at it every year, and um, it's a really good opportunity. So I just encourage you, if you want your taxes done for free, use this. It's not, it hasn't been overwhelmed by people, believe it or not. Um, so there, I don't have any doubt that you could have your needs met unless you have a lot of financial complexity that they don't handle, which I don't have the ability to define for you right now. Um, but yeah, that's happening. And the Senior Tax Work-Off Program has started because it's the beginning of the month. It'll conclude in late October, and the people helping us in our department are Linda LaDuc and Diane Tulpa, who's delivering lunches. And for the first time ever, we had a couple of um, veteran tax work-off um, applicants who will be working. Um, Oh, and Joanne Gregoire will be working at the library again. So three seniors and two veterans, um, Alan Weinberg and Angela Breeze, will be working in other departments. Alan okay. will be working at the library. Um, so that, that's, that's also good to have that underway. Very good. It's exciting. It really is exciting to be part of something that's just active. Yeah, I know. There's like tons going on always. <laughs> Never a dull moment. That is definitely true. And we're so happy, and I just want to extend another welcome to Sarah, and thank, thank you for joining. I'm, you know, pleasure. glad to have you as an official member today. Thank you. Yeah. Anything else? Do we have a motion to adjourn? I make a motion we adjourn the meeting. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye.